I know when I usually talk about good episodes of Power Rangers, I always open the next review talking about momentum and how this episode has the potential to either keep the hype train moving or derail it entirely with a missing track. However, while I still feel that way, it's hard for me to lower my expectations for the second episode of Beast Morphers. The reason I loved the season premiere of this show so much is because it gave me everything I've wanted from Power Rangers ever since Saban bought the rights for the franchise back from Disney. Mainly a show that can be serious and intense when it needs to, but also knows how to have fun. While I rarely ever got that from the Neo Saban era of Power Rangers, Lego Ninjago was more than happy to step in and fill that void for me for the past eight years. Similar to that show, Beast Morphers spent a majority of its first episode setting up the board for the long chess game it was about to play, and the reason I'm not worried about this episode is because it's clear that all the game pieces are not in place yet. The only conceivable way that I can see this episode failing is by doing what Super Steel did when it lit the board on fire because the show decided they didn't want to play chess anymore. However, as unlikely as that is, I suppose the possibility is always there, so let's see if the smoke alarms go off as we look at Power Rangers Beast Morphers Episode 2, Evox's Revenge. The episode opens with a previously on segment. Interesting that Power Rangers would do this after a first episode, but Ninjago has previously on segments at the beginning of each episode, so hopefully this is yet another cue this show is taking from LEGO. Also, instead of saying previously on Power Rangers, this episode instead says previously on Beast Morphers. Not sure if that means anything, but I can speculate on that later. Anyway, the episode officially begins with the Blaze and Roxy clones appearing in the cyber dimension, having just been teleported there because of what happened last episode. The two are not alone though, as Nate also apparently teleported a section of his computer system that contained the Evox virus. The villains are almost immediately met by a guy named Scruzzle, who introduces himself as the lord of this dimension. But when Scruzzle tries to assert his dominance over the three, Evox swiftly defeats his henchman called Tronix, demanding that Scruzzle bow down to him. Pleading for his life, Scruzzle is happy to serve his new master, saying he has a teleporter to help Evox leave the cyberverse, but it's out of power. At that point, Evil Roxy presents Scruzzle with the remainder of their Morphex to power his teleporter, but while they have enough Morphex to transfer avatars and robots, they need a lot more to transport something as big as Evox. Hearing this, Evox orders Blaze to teleport with Scruzzle back to Coral Harbor so they can collect more Morphex, at which point we cut to Grid Battle Force to check on the Rangers. The team is seen exiting the battle simulator, which we'll probably never see, and Nate tells the Rangers that Commander Shaw wants them to meet her for an announcement. You know something? Isn't it obvious? I bet the commander's going to announce me as a team leader. Well, just because she's your mom doesn't mean that she'll pick you. I mean, what if I want a job? You. Really. Oh, here we go. Seen this before. <laughs> Sir, she's a girl. When the three meet with Shaw, she introduces them to the team's new beast bots, which means, yay, more robot friends! In all seriousness, these bots actually do serve a purpose since they operate as the control consoles for the team Zords, and Devin's bot can transform into a motorcycle. They all even have names and different quirks. Zoe's bot is named Jax, who doesn't like to be called cute, Ravi's bot is named Smash, who likes hugs, and Devin's bot is named Cruz, who is forgetful. Also, he's voiced by Kelson Henderson. Glad you're still getting work, man. After introductions, the security team then walks in, named here as Ben and Betty, and surprisingly, they're not wearing their security security uniforms. Commander Shaw explains that the two help out around the base for whatever she needs, and here they've shown up to demonstrate a zap -matic. In typical comedy fashion, things don't go well for the duo since they end up electrocuting themselves before we cut back to the villains in the cyber dimension. While we were gone, Scruzzle told the avatars that he's been hiding in the cyberverse from a robot named Vargyle, and that he built the Tronics for protection from the threat. As the conversation continues, Scruzzle gives Bad Blaze and Rotten Roxy keys that he's upgraded with the Morphex, that will allow them to teleport, but while Blaze and Scruzzle head to the city, Roxy stays behind in the cyberverse. Back with the Rangers, Shaw shows the team their Zords, adding that it's critical that the team have the right leader, with Ravi immediately cutting his mother off to accept the role. Zoe jumps in, expressing interest at being team leader, resulting in the two going back and forth as they try to convince Shaw how each of them is right for the job. Ravi even brings up how he's the only member of the team that was trained to be a Ranger. Shaw asks Devin for his thoughts on the matter, 
matter, but of course the Red Ranger is more interested in talking about his new toys. The alarm suddenly sounds, with Ben and Betty coming in to tell Shaw of the threat's location, so the Rangers spring into action, with the duo joining them as backup. The Rangers soon find Blaze and Scruzzle, as they're stealing more effects from a distribution truck, so Devin tells Ben and Betty to hang back while they handle the villains. Blaze morphs before introducing Scruzzle, as well as summoning Tronix, which is the cue for the action to begin. During the fight, Ravi and Zoe decide to stop everything so they can argue about who would be the better leader, to the point where it takes Devin's input to get the two focused on the task at hand. While the team is busy with the Tronix, Blaze wonders if Scruzzle has any other tricks, and it turns out he does. Having uploaded a portion of the E-Box virus into a key, Scruzzle can then charge that key with some more effects, and one, two, three, he can now make Robotron monsters. The newly created Cycletron squares up to the Rangers just as they finish off the Tronix, but to take on this threat, it's now Morphin' Time. Look at that morph sequence. It has tornadoes. Haven't seen that anywhere before. Ninja! Cyclone Doe! Blaze and Scruzzle retreat with the more effects, leaving Cycletron and Mortronics to deal with the morphed rangers, leading to a pretty good fight scene. Problems do arise, however, when Devin outright freezes at the sight of a dog, but luckily Ben and Betty hilariously protect him from a Tronic until the dog leaves, allowing Devin to move. Things then get worse for the other rangers, as Ravi gets heated in his fight against Cycletron. What's happening to me? Whoa, guys, slow down. This is only the second episode. Rangers shouldn't be fighting now. Devin uses his speed to take Robbie's blaster so we can finish off Cyclotron, and with the monsters scrapped, the Rangers are taken back to Grid Battle Force to figure out what's going wrong. Cut to the Cyberverse, where Scruzzle disappointingly reports that thanks to the Rangers, they still don't have enough more effects to transport Evox to Coral Harbor. But Scruzzle does say that there is enough more effects to power one of his multiple giant Giga Drones, which should allow the villains to take a more effect tower. At GB, Nate can't figure out why the team went haywire on the field, while Ravi and Zoe weakly try to continue their feud. Devin's had enough of this and finally talks to his teammates, telling them how Ben and Betty saved him earlier by acting as a team, and that the Rangers need to pull it together if they want to stop Blaze. After Zoe and Ravi apologize for their behavior, Devin goes out to investigate why he froze earlier, but he's interrupted by the arrival of Scruzzle's Giga Drone. In a previous scene, Scruzzle had mentioned how his Giga Drones morph with Robotron data when they teleport, which is why this machine looks like Cycletron. Meaning that, while there's no monsters growing this season, the Rangers will have Zord fights with robot clones. Speaking of Zord fight, Devin springs into action since Zoe and Ravi are still in recovery, but he's not alone as Cruz helps the Red Ranger link with the Racer Zord before initiating battle mode. Devin puts up a good fight against the Giga Drone until a doggy billboard literally stops him in his tracks. With Devin neutralized, the Giga Drone goes about attacking a Morphex tower, so Shaw orders Nate to get her rangers back in the fight. Looking at the billboard, Nate realizes that the team briefly came into contact with the Evox virus when they became rangers, which caused them all to have weaknesses related to their animal DNA. Weaknesses like Devin freezing up around dogs, Zoe needing carrots to replenish her energy, and Ravi taking on the gorilla trait of losing his cool if he gets too hot. I think. Not too sure on that one, but the concept is cool. Now that Zoe and Ravi are cured, they head out in their Zords to stop the Giga Drone, with Zoe using her Zords Jack Rabbit mode to send the bot right at Devin, taking his eyes off the dog billboard. Devin instantly calls on the Cheetah Beast blaster he saw earlier to finally finish off the Giga Drone, and after the fight, Shaw congratulates the team on a successful first mission. Commander Shaw then moves on to the topic of leader, but is again cut off, this time by Zoe, who says that she and Ravi would like Devin to be the leader, since he talked them down earlier. Devin accepts the responsibility after some urging by his team before thanking Ben and Betty for their help, and the episode ends with a big group hug that results in everyone getting shocked by the Zappomatic. This episode is about on par with the premiere, with one notable issue that I'll go ahead and start with since it's so minor. I have no clue why this episode is called Evox's Revenge. I mean, the guy is barely in the thing, and instead of going into his backstory like I hoped the show would, we still 
know virtually nothing about the baddie, pun intended. This isn't necessarily a problem now, but if the show ends up not having any backstory for Evox, then he'll become as bland and boring as most of Neo Saban's villains. But at least we do have developed generals this time around in Blaze and Roxy. Here we get what is essentially the premise of the season, with Blaze and or Roxy traveling to Coral Harbor so they can collect enough more effects and allow Evox to return to the city. It's rare that a Power Ranger season actually writes in a reason for the villains to be attacking episodically like this, to the point where I can't even remember the last time the show did this. In fact, Beast Morphers puts in a ton of thought into all the traditional tropes that we're used to seeing on Power Rangers. For example, Ben and Betty could have been another Victor and Monty, with comedy bits that are completely separate from what the Rangers are doing. But instead, they're closer to what Boom's actual role was in SPD, since they're here to help grid battle force operations and can even assist the team sometimes. The show also continues introducing characters here, with every single one of them filling a necessary role. I've already mentioned how the Beast Bots serve much more of a purpose here than Redbot did in Ninja Steel, but I honestly don't know if that's an element of Go Busters that Beast Morphers just decided to keep. For my Sentai Watchers out there, please let me know who I should praise here. Blaze and Roxy also get sort of a sidekick in the form of Scruzzle, who despite the name, actually gave me a lot to look forward to in terms of character. Superficially, he is the intelligent general, responsible for building all the villain's tech, which includes teleporters, monsters, and foot soldiers. However, it's also made clear that he has ambitions to rule over others, and the only reason he's serving Evox is because he's terrified of the snake. Once again, Beast Morphers provides a variety of directions for this character to go, which creates a level of unpredictability. I have no clue if and or when Scruzzle will turn on Evox, nor do I know what'll happen when Vargyle enters the picture. But like with every other character on this show, these questions will keep me intrigued for what Scruzzle will do next. Now that I've got the season-related stuff out of the way, let's actually talk about the plot of this episode. As if Beast Morphers didn't have enough going on, this plot is actually two woven together, since the Rangers have to deal with not only who should be leader, but also the side effects of the Evox virus. Something I didn't mention in my last review was how unbelievable it was that the Evox virus wouldn't still be present in Nate's computer system after the heroes teleported the villains away. At the time, I thought it was one of those things that I'd have to suspend my disbelief on, but I never guessed that the virus would affect the rangers themselves when they got their animal DNA. Because Evox was ultimately responsible for the rangers gaining animal-specific weaknesses, it makes things like Devon freezing up around dogs come off way less cheesy than it could have been. To be fair, the other rangers' weaknesses aren't that goofy, and I do really like them, but for different reasons. Zoe needing carrots to replenish her energy does sound a little too cartoonish on paper, but the show does use it to subtly put across the message of eating your vegetables. Typically, Power Rangers would set aside a whole episode to focus on the plot of eating healthy, so having the Yellow Ranger demonstrate that same message throughout the season is a nice change of pace. Ravi going on a rampage because of his gorilla DNA is the only weakness that sounds cool in this episode, but I am a little confused with how the rage is triggered. At first I thought that the Blue Ranger's anger is what set it off, but watching the episode again, it looks like the literal temperature is what caused him to overheat. It seems like the show isn't entirely sure how that works either, since Nate quickly rushes through his theory, but I would like a concrete explanation somewhere down the road. One thing I did speculate on last time was how the leadership of the team was going to be handled, but again, I didn't call that it would be Ravi and Zoe fighting over the top spot. I guess this show reminded me so much of SPD that I took it as a foregone conclusion that we would revisit the Red Ranger vs. Blue Ranger feud. Meanwhile, Beast Morphers was more concerned about how these characters would legitimately behave, and as a result, totally blindsided me with this dynamic. Sure, Ravi was the one who thought the role of leader was automatically his because of his training, but of course Zoe would be the one to challenge him because she's always looking to prove herself, and what better way than to be leader of the team. There's also this blink and you miss it moment when Zoe and Ravi are arguing on the field, and Zoe mentions that she was only cut from Battle Force Cadet because she was juggling a job at the time. I don't know if the show will ever bring that up again, but it would be a nice thing to explore later. The situation also provides a potential character direction for Devin, who through most of the episode just lets his teammates compete with each other for the spot of leader. Despite being the Red Ranger, Devin shows absolutely no desire to take up the role that is traditionally meant for him, which he had 
had to have known about since his dad demonstrated his ranger knowledge last episode. Every time he's asked who should lead the team, Devin either changes the subject or gets cut off before he can finish his thoughts. It's very possible that Mayor Daniels was right to call Devin out for being irresponsible last time and that he really doesn't have any plans for his future. Heck, the only reason Devin accepts the leadership role is because his friends ask him to, so it's possible that he might not even be ready to shoulder that responsibility. Of course, we won't really know until he's put to the test, which could happen sooner or later depending on how the season plays out. Overall, this is a pretty good follow-up to the premiere. Sure, it's not perfect and I did have a few issues, but it still takes a cue from Ninjago by simultaneously introducing characters and elements as it continues to build a strong foundation. Could Beast Morphers still fail? Yes, but that possibility will most likely shrink with each passing episode. Now on to some channel related manners. I'd like to apologize for how long it took this review to come out. On top of not having enough time to work on this because of illness and travel, these reviews are also way denser than any episode reviews I'm used to writing, so this script was actually finished days ago. However, fear not, for I have finally gotten back into the groove of things, so hopefully I can finish the first half of this season before the hiatus is over. Fingers crossed. I'm Nick, aka IronBet1993, and may the power protect you.